I hope they do something new. I hope they stand up for their communities. I hope that they never let what the world says about them cloud what they feel about themselves. Adia. Finally, we're sitting down for the Shanaysia's Teacher Podcast. Yes. Thank you for making time for us today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. This is a long time coming. So this episode is all about the magic that a Shanaysia's teacher creates, right? The synergy of that between art and exploration of self in Black history, because it's February. It's, it's Black History Month. And just an editorial note about Black History Month, we really do appreciate that the nation takes a month to focus on Black history, but we know it's Black history, 365 days. 365. 365 of all. Where's that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so I vaguely remember my experience at elementary school at the art. I had some cardboard, I had some markers, maybe a little glue, yes. some clay, but clearly my teacher was not called an artillery stud. Right. So tell me, what in the world does that mean? So I have the coolest job in all of the world. Um, I'm an art teacher in a lot of ways, but I'm also, I like to consider myself more of a language teacher and the lead delve in the language of materials, right? So we do a lot of process art, we do a lot of thinking routines, a lot of exploration, less we're gonna paint a sunflower more how can we move this paint to do whatever we want it to do at any given moment? So it's, I work in tandem with the teachers, um, but once the kids get really good at a language, then when they go into their classrooms and they're doing projects, they could say, oh, I know I want to use wire because I've already like explored wire, right? So I know that if I'm making a snake, maybe instead of Play-Doh, maybe wire is what I want to use because I can move it how I want to move it. So we do all of that sort of language building in the art studio or the atelier. So let's, let's, let's take a step back. But this isn't your average art teacher, you know. So what's the difference between what you do and what, let's say, a kid is accustomed to doing in that hour or so that's devoted to art. And then let us know, how did, you, how did you become this? In a more traditional art class, you would maybe be making a turkey, like a hand prayed turkey. Right, right. Our remedies. Yeah. If you, especially in pre-K, right? Like you're making a more like, we're gonna put our hand in paint, we're gonna right. stick it, we're gonna turn this paper plate. Yeah, yes. we're gonna thaw it. Right, but in the art, in the atelier, if we were gonna study turkeys, then we would think about like, what makes a good feather, right? And like, what makes a turkey a turkey? Like, why isn't a chicken a turkey? We would start thinking about why humans are turkeys and what makes us different. And then what materials we could use to make a feather and what materials we could use to make whatever this gobble gobble thing is on a turkey, right? So we do a lot of close looking I think what I'm able to do that other art teachers aren't is that I have the time, right? To be fair, like they don't have the same amount of time that I have. I don't take all the kids at once. I take half a class at once. And part of that is so we have the time to like really think and wonder about what it is we want to make. Yeah. I have so many questions. Yes. Okay. okay. So first you said not to end. Yes. What is that? Okay. For those who are not familiar. And then secondly, did you always want this job? What was your journey to being an atelierista? An atelier is a workshop. Basically, it's a French word for workshop. And it's a workshop for artisans. You see it a lot in fashion. But what we do in there is it's really just a workshop for the kids, just a workshop for materials. Only for free kids. So that's ages three and four. Yep. Okay. And so how did you land this job? What's your journey? My journey. I was a Reggio classroom teacher before we became, before Friendship took over the school that I was at. Mm -hmm. And when we came here, um, all of us didn't get to come and our old director said, I want you to be the atelierista. And I said, why? 
why do you want that? And she said, I watch what you do every day and you were made for this job. She said, you are a wonderful teacher, but in creating wonder and spaces where children can really, really, really explore and be free, she was like, you're the only person I know that can do it. And it's been years of me trying new things, years of trying to find the balance of what works for me because at the end of the day, like I have to also feel safe. And so what works for me and what I'm willing to like let them do and what they're willing to let me do. And so the kids and I have been working on this balance since I started here. So I'm really intrigued, but you said the balance, right? So I have to be comfortable with the amount of freedom that I give the kids and then it has to work for me and work for them. What, what does that mean? So this is a question that we grapple with and I think Part of the Reggio Emilia philosophy is that the biggest part of it is that we believe that children are capable. They innately come in with everything they need. And so I'm not pouring into them. They already have it. I, there's, I'm just guiding them so they can bring out what's best in themselves, but I'm not giving them anything that they don't already have. And so because of that, I had to really think about if a child says to me, Miss Adia, I want to draw on the table, I want to sit on the table and draw. I can either say no, or I can say, yes, we can do this with parameters, but I have to think about how much is my thought about school? How much is my thought about what an art studio looks like? And how much is really me honoring the fact that they are capable and if I believe that they're capable, hmm. then I have to act that way, even if there's tension with what I know, right? And what I feel. And that has been a really tricky place to navigate, but it's been the best place to navigate. And I think it's made me so much better and it's made our time together um, so much better because I let them like, if they can, if they can safely do it, mm -hmm. then we do it. So that's a tricky space, you know, especially in public schools. This sounds like it's it's structure, but it's driven by, you know, creativity and freedom and just really kind of going where the child is leading you. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. So there are definitely rules. I think there is a sort of misconception that it's just a free for all, mm -hmm. but we can't do this work if we don't have some sort of parameters, right? So my rules are we're, we're kind to each other. We don't give up on ourselves, we encourage each other, we're kind to materials, and we embrace our mistakes, right? And those rules look different in how they show up, but if we don't have those rules, then it's just chaos. And so it's not a chaos sort of thing. It, it may look like chaos sometimes, it's a very controlled chaos. Interesting, because there's, there's this kind of stream of thought, are you playing or are you learning, right? And so, you know, if you just kind of look at the stage or the kind of the environment that public education is in right now, there's just hyper focus on student outcomes and, and academic expectations. And so, you know, students and schools are really graded by how well they're doing on these assessments. Now, I know pre-K four, pre-K three, you know, they're excluded from standardized yes. testing. However, it kind of this, this emphasis is kind of trickled down in some places to these kind of, you know, fundamental grade. What are some of those, I would say, kind of embedded structures, kind of that kind of the science of, of the, the Reggio Emilia philosophy that are embedded in what you and your kids are doing every day? How is what you're doing in that art studio preparing them for kindergarten, for first grade, for second grade? I think in the art studio and in our Reggio inspired classrooms, one of the things that we are is we are teaching our kids to be researchers. And we do that through allowing them to make their own mistakes and figure out why something works, how something works. We're taking things apart. We're testing hypotheses all the time. Um, we were making planets once and someone wanted to make Neptune and they said, Neptune is blue. This idea, I wanna make it out of blue M&Ms. And I'm like, okay, this is gonna be weird and messy, but- And they can choose their material. They can choose their material. So I'm yeah. like, okay, we're gonna do blue M&Ms. They got a hot blue gun. M&Ms are melting everywhere. Oh my God. Everywhere. There's just chocolate. No all one's over trying the place. to eat the M&Ms. No one's trying to eat No, no, they're not trying to eat They're, not trying to eat. Too. they're, okay, right. they're just... gluing the things down, okay. right? But because it's chocolate, it's melting. Right. And I knew it was gonna melt. 
I knew it wasn't gonna stay, mm -hmm. but I let him figure out like why that wasn't gonna work. And so he looks at me and he says, this isn't working. I think the chocolate is too soft for this to work. I need a different material, right? Mm -hmm. And so we allow the kids the space to we set up spaces so that they can critically decide what works for them and what doesn't. And I think those are the kind of skills that you do better on a standardized test if you can critically think, right? Like you can do better in the world if you can weigh your options, even if you make a choice that even after you weigh your options isn't great. At least we know you thought about it first. <laughs> At least we know you had like some deep deciding going on there. And so I think, I hope that's the best thing that we do for them. I hope that we leave them with this love of learning and that we leave them with this knowledge that like they are researchers, they are thinkers, they are doers, they're makers mm -hmm. and yeah. Okay, so can can we get into some magic? Yes, yes. So you know, that's, that's <laughs> okay, so I've had to, we gotta get into the magic, right? The magic that frankly is you and this studio. So one of the reasons why I just had to have you come on this podcast. I was at Friendship Public Charter School, Friendship Armstrong Campus. You had on fairy wings, you had on a crown that was adorable with Laura and Trana. I was my, you know, four-year-old, five-year-old self, okay? So tell me, why didn't you choose to be a bear? How did all that come about? <laughs> that had, how was that connected to the learning process? So that came because the children were looking for treasures and I needed them to understand that that treasures are a lot of different things, right? It's not just something that you bought or something that someone gave you. Like treasures are hidden things. They're secret things. They're things that, you know, I'm like looking on the floor now, looking for treasures, but I'm always looking for treasures. But the kid, one of the kids did something about a fairy and I came in the next day. I decided, like I ordered all this stuff from Amazon and I decorated the ceiling and I had flowers hanging. And I got wings, the lights are out, there's flora hanging, mm -hmm. there's twinkle lights on, mm -hmm. there's like sparkly music in the background. I have two different screens projecting the imagery of like forests and there's a note on the wall. And in my best handwriting, my best fairy handwriting, and it said, best fairy thing. my best fairy handwriting. And it said, dear children, um, I met Miss Adia and I'm a fairy and she told me you were looking for treasure. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to tell you guys like how to find the best treasure because fairies are obviously really good at finding treasure. Um, and so that's what the note said. It said, look for the things that other people overlook. I love that. Because there's treasure everywhere. There's treasure everywhere. Right, and there's treasure in the small thing. With the everyday things. That's where the, the best treasures are, right? It's the stuff that's like hiding in plain sight. That's good stuff. Yeah, and so then, I walked around with wings on, looking for treasure with the children. We found bottle caps, we found the ends of a, like that broken pencils. And what did they say they were? Oh, we kept them. So we have collections in my space, like that they're like every time they find something and they're like putting, we're making this collection, like we each have our own collection of like treasures. Um, and they're just really pointing out things that like, that they think are amazing. So, but what, in your mind, what does all this mean? There's a curiosity part to it, right? There's a curiosity. There's this idea that, you know, you should be curious, you should be explorers, right? But then, is there is there a process that you're trying to impart? I'm I think, thinking about it. No, I mean, no, I think, I think that's fair. I think what we, what I want them to do is I want them to never overlook anything, right? right? I don't want them to overlook anyone or anything, right? And just because things don't fit into the way that we're taught they should fit into doesn't mean that they don't have value right and i need them to like understand that so maybe it's a broken pencil to me but to someone maybe it's the antenna on a dog that they make or like an alien dog or i don't know whatever it is it could be a phone it could be anything right okay. like it could turn into okay i don't even know something that doesn't hopefully something that doesn't even exist yet because I also want them to understand that like everything that we know, someone had to figure it out, right? And everything that we see around us, like it wasn't always there, like someone made it. And so 
I want them to be innovators. And I think that's also part of what this like uncovering is. Like we're uncovering these parts of ourselves, but we're not, nothing gets overlooked. Everything has value. So speaking of uncovering things and finding these hidden gems about ourselves, you work in a really incredible space that's rooted in black history. So I was really just excited to find out, did not know that one of the world's revered artist, Alma Thomas, walked the halls of your school and really discovered her early love for art. In fact, I had a piece with the Washington Post in her words, she said when she walked into the Armstrong School and walked into that art studio, she said it felt like heaven. How does working in this historic space inspire you? And then how do you help your students reflect on just kind of the meaning of black art and the impact of black art? I try my hardest um, to really, I think there's who we all know, right? There's the people we all know. There's the artists we all know. And I think there are elements of our history that we don't know as much about, or the narrative around them is very much not what they were about. Mm -hmm. And I think the Black Panther Party for self defense is one of those, one of those pieces of art history that is like that. So we were eating snack. No, we were eating breakfast, and I told them, I said, "Did you know that we get breakfast for free every day, thanks to the Black Panther Party for self defense?" They were feeding children in Oakland. They were giving them lunch. They were giving them groceries. They were setting up health clinics and all of those things that we have now. So breakfast in school, right? That came from them. Um, WIC, that came from them. That came from initiatives that they had started. But I needed the kids to know that like, we take care of ourselves. Like we take care of our community. We keep us safe. We keep us healthy. We keep us committed. And we have to do that. Um, in the face of the world. Did you amplify those words with images? Or if you're sitting around oh, yes, having yes, breakfast, yes. I you know, describe your classroom. I know there's stools. If you guys are sitting on the stools and you're having breakfast and we're talking about, then you're making the connection yes. to yourself with something as simple and routine as kind of a morning bite to this really influential and transformative chapter in American history. So how did that take a, did it take a visual? It did, so in the classroom that I was in that morning, eating with them, we set up Dramatic Play to be a free health clinic, right? We showed them pictures, we showed them imagery of the Black Panther Party. We show, we always, there's always like a grounding in the imagery, if we can find it, of the time. Um, nothing is like just, made up off of our heads like so we show them the historical images and we did like i see i think i wonder and they talked about what they saw what they thought was happening the other kids who were helping them like had like black berets on right like they looked like the black panther party oh it was really a wonderful wonderful time so you've got two uh, pieces of work uh by your students right behind you over your shoulder and i'm thinking about i see i think i wonder can you talk a little bit about uh, the art pieces behind you? The one with the hair over here, the big black cloud of lovely. That was definitely, I see, I think I wonder. And we were looking at the work of Lorna Simpson. And she has these really great collages where she cuts out, um, she uses like imagery from like old jet magazines and stuff. And she cuts out the faces and then she watercolors the hair. Go look her up, it's stunning. She did Rihanna for Essence, amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was what we were, we were thinking about, cause the hair is like watercolored, right? So it's giving watery, it's giving, it's, it's even ethereal. Vital. Yeah, it's, it's all it's, of it. It's giving, it's giving magnificent. And so this picture of the hair is after doing the I See, I Think, I Wonder of Lorna Simpson. 
um, Florina Simpson. And so is she saying, who is she channeling? So she was telling me that her hair had all of this power, right? And this is her hair. Power. Power, right? This yes. is her magical hair. Right. With its power. And right. viewer has to figure Listen, some things I out for that. themselves. I can't give it all up to you. Up. Have yeah. to sure I think I see I won. <laughs> yes. I love it. Exactly. I love it. So and better. the other one was more of a process art. Okay. So there was What no, is process art? So process art is really just we make things not to have a finished product. We make things to explore. And so the kids know that a lot of times what you what we do at the end of a class, you're not gonna keep, right? We're just gonna we're gonna make it. We're gonna make it until we push the material to the become limit, something. So it becomes something and then it becomes something we don't want. Right? So wow. there's like this like really sweet spot in the middle where where I'm like, do you wanna stop? And they're like, no. Mm -hmm. And then it just turns into like a puddle of something. Sometimes you get this behind me. Sometimes you get, um, sometimes you get a puddle, but all of it teaches us something, right? So this kid, I'm pretty sure learned, right? That like when you use the brush a certain way and there's not enough paint on it, you can see like where the strokes are very like, some of them are really thin, some of them are thicker. And that was really the whole experience. And that's all we needed from that experience. Sometimes we just learn things just to learn them, not to keep them. Adia, I love the fact that in your studio, <laughs> learning is magic. Learning is freedom. Learning is affirmation of self. So tell me, you know, you, you're in this business because you love kids and, and you're a creative at heart. What are your hopes for your students? I really hope that they change the world and not in the way that like, like I hope they do something new that's never existed yet. I hope they stand up for their communities. I hope they stay rooted in their communities no matter where they go. I hope that they stay thinkers and readers and doers and makers. I really, really, really hope they stay makers. Oh, I hope they keep making things for the joy of making things. Um, it makes me very sad when kids tell me that they can't do a thing. Um, and I don't, I think we I hope that they never let what the world says about them cloud what they feel about themselves. Listen, thank you so much for being tenacious. Thank you so much for being incredible. Thank you so much for being magic for Son of Vibe. We need more teachers like you in classrooms across this country. Keep changing what education looks like. Keep inspiring our babies. Thank you. Thank you for having me up.